right, welcome back to stage C. In just a few moments, we'll have Chris Wright. Excellent. Chris Wright, who uh, is come from Switzerland, and will be talking about reinventing invention. And I hear tell he's an inventor himself, so he has a lot of experience with this. So thanks very much, Chris, and please, round of applause to welcome Chris. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, so yeah, just a bit of an introduction uh, is that I've been working for this uh, small company in Switzerland uh, for the past kind of two and a half years um, called iProva. Um, and what they're doing is, uh, is kind of trying to take a, a new approach to, uh, to inventing and inventions by, um, by trying to work out uh, what, what is the science of invention, sort of how do you invent um, efficiently and effectively and also how do you use new tools that are available to us now um, to actually augment the human invention process. Um, and just a bit of a disclaimer, I know some of these slides have the company name all over them but uh, I'm not trying to sell the company. Uh, the talk is going to be more about uh, the kind of background of um, what is an inventor, what are inventions, uh, how do we uh, how do we make them and how can we facilitate that process using uh, AI? So, so the first question is, um, is what is an invention? Um, people seem to have uh, quite broad-ranging conceptions of uh, what an invention might be. Um, and usually people think of some, some famous products like uh, the light bulb or something like that um, that is uh, an invention in itself. But um, an invention should be really conceptualized as, a, well, yeah, at a, at a more conceptual level. It isn't a product, like a kettle or a car. Um, these things actually consi uh, consist of many, many uh, small nuggets of inventions. Um, and th this is sort of the, um, the elementary particle for, a, for, a, for an inventor, is uh, the inventive step. Is um, what's, what's the elementary new thing um, that is in your idea? that hasn't been seen before in, in, in human knowledge. And so that's, uh, that's the f one of the first um, definitions of, of an invention, um, which uh, probably the best or, or most um, widely accepted view of invention is, uh, is from patents. And of course, patents uh, protect inventions, and the invention therefore has to fit several categories, uh, several criteria. The first one is that they have to be new, so novel. It can't have been seen before, you can't reinvent the wheel. Uh, the second is that they have to be useful. Um, you could easily inv invent something new that solves a problem that doesn't exist. You could, um, you could inv invent something for traveling between Mars and the next galaxy or something like that. Um, and this would not be a current use. It wouldn't be currently useful because we haven't gotten to Mars. Um, or in fact, you can invent magic and that's not useful. <laughs> Uh, and it, but it also has to be non-obvious. So this is, a, this is a really important step, and it's what uh, kind of filters out a lot of, the, uh, a lot of the patents and a lot of the inventions that are not actual inventions. They are new, but, they're not, um, but they are obvious. So if, if I know about a microwave, for example, and I know about cars, just sticking a car on a microwave combines the two things in a new way. Nobody's done that before, maybe. But it's obvious. It's just a car and a microwave together. Nothing new has been added there. The, 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 the two elements create um, not just four, not more than the sum of its parts. Um, and this actually brings me to the, to, to the most elegant description I've found of, of invention, um, which is at the bottom there that, um, of the slides, that uh, two, point, two plus two needs to equal five or more for it to be an invention. You need to have started with these ingredients and you need to combine them in a way which creates um, a product that's more than the sum of its parts. And that, that really, to me, is the most elegant way of defining the invention. But how do you come up with one? What is, what is this light bulb moment that people talk about? Um, for me, the, that, that describes this, this addition. So if I'm the first person to consider putting uh, these two elements together that have never been combined. And I think, well, OK, so I'm putting two things together. Maybe that's slightly interesting. But the invention is when you realize that there's something more to it that you can do, that you can create 
that um, uh, that some new system or some new uh, mechanism which has never existed before that um, that increases the value of that uh, product or invention. So the second question is, who is an inventor? Um, can anybody invent? People have this uh, conceptualization of perhaps an inventor as a crazy guy in a shed, that um, inspiration just comes to them uh, out of nowhere, out of the blue. Um, and this is, a, this is a perception that I, I want to kind of try and dispel over the next uh, 20 minutes or so. Um, and what I want to try and get across is that anybody can invent. Anybody can be an inventor. Um, it takes um, a human mind, or, or at least an intelligent mind, to, to put things together in a, in, a, in a clever way. But there's a lot of smart people in the world, and they're all trying to solve all of the problems that humanity is facing. So what differentiates an inventor um, from someone who doesn't manage to, to, to create that invention? And the answer is um, the invention triggers the information that they have. If you look back through history, it's always uh, not the smartest people who are the most successful inventors. It's the people who have access to the most uh, surprising, the most useful, and the most distant information from different domains create the most disruptive and amazing inventions. So, um, so this is known as, uh, or this can be illustrated by the inevitability of invention. Um, and these patterns are seen throughout history, where you have uh, inventions that are, that are made um, simultaneously in completely different countries or different continents with um, no collaboration whatsoever. Uh, the invention is created by, the, by different groups or different people um, who have the same input information. So again, it's sort of reiterating that the in, that the inventors are not special. What's special is the information. What's required is the information. Um, so this is an example here of the CT scanner, where, <clears throat> of course, there were, at the time in the 1970s and 60s, there were, um, uh, there were huge advances, leaps and bounds happening in terms of high-performance computing. And there was also um, research and growing knowledge on uh, x-rays and x-ray imaging. Um, and so these two people, uh, Godfrey Hanfield and Alan McCormack, um, both independently came up with the idea that we could combine these two things and we could design algorithms for high-performance computers to actually um, resolve an image in three dimensions using a series of two-dimensional scans around a person. So this was a fantastic invention, but it was inevitable given these advances in this information that was becoming available from the X-ray field and from high-performance computing. It was this combination of two distant fields that created the, um, the CT scanner. Um, and the same can be seen um, time and time again throughout history. There's lots and lots of examples, so these, this isn't by any means exhaustive, but there's some uh, famous examples. But of course, uh, Newton and Leibniz both independently invented calculus. The same information was available to them in mathematical papers in uh, two different places around the world. Um, Alexander Graham Bell and Alicia Gray both filed a patent for the telephone on the same day within three hours of each other. Um, again, reinforcing just how, uh, how time critical these inventions can be. As soon as the information is available to people, people will make the link. So it's the information that matters. And, um, and of course, Edison, with the most famous example of an invention, the light bulb, there were actually 23 people um, who had built prototype light bulbs before him. And in fact, all of these um, diagrams here are all patent diagrams for different people who have invented a light bulb. And these are just the different um, embodiments for how they thought the light bulb would look. Um, so. All inventions are inevitable, but all inventions are not created equal. Um, so in every field, uh, like cars or, um, or packaging or semiconductors, in every field that people work in, um, incremental inventions happen. So ideas are recombined within the field, they're developed incrementally, people improve upon them, and this creates a growing wealth of knowledge and products and general improvement within that individual field. Um, and that's great. And that actually creates the 
vast majority of patents that, that, um, that are put through all patent offices in the world. But um, these are not the most disruptive inventions. They don't change the world. They aren't surprising, necessarily. Um, so actually, it's been found by a lot of different studies and observed by a lot of famous people that the most disruptive inventions actually happen when um, insights come from very different areas, very different technology areas or knowledge areas, where you get surprising or unexpected um, insights uh, from, a, from a completely far off area, and you're able to make a link between two very disparate areas uh, that nobody else could because you were the only one with that combined information. So the, the, the rarity of them is actually being able to have that knowledge from two distant fields. Um, and this guy, Clarence Birdseye, is a, is a fantastic example of this, and he's got a really great story. Um, so he is Captain Birdseye um, of, of, of Birdseye fame, um, and he started the company, and he also uh, invented modern freezers, basically. Um, so frozen foods actually existed before Mr. Birdseye. Um, but he was, they weren't very good. Um, they, they didn't keep the food fre fresh for very long, uh, and they didn't take off, they weren't popular. Um, they were being used in New York. Um, and so Clarence was aware of uh, modern freezer technology. He thought it was interesting, but you know, he, he, he was curious about it, but um, it wasn't his uh, main area. He was a taxidermist, actually. So really interested in other forms of preservation of biological tissue. Um, and he was working for, as, a, as a biologist uh, for the US government. He got sent to Canada. Uh, and in Canada, um, he was living there for five years. While he was ice fishing, um, he, um, the, the, the Inuit showed him how to ice fish in these, uh, in, these, in these rings. You cut out the section of ice, you fish, take the fish out into the cold Arctic air, uh, and you take it home with you. Um, and it can keep for months and months. And he realized that actually, um, this fish stayed fresh for much, much longer than, um, than the previous freezing techniques. So he realized it tasted much, much better than the techniques that they were using um, in New York. Um, and he did some investigation, and he actually found out that uh, it was the combination of the wind and the, and the instant flash freezing um, of that fish that was brought out of the water, and it froze instantly. And that was what did it. Uh, that was what created the conditions for, for keeping the freshness that created small ice crystals that didn't break down the cell walls of the fish, and so it kept the texture and the flavor of the fish. Um, and so he subsequently went on to found Birdseye, patented uh, many, uh, over 300 patents in modern refrigeration. But it, the original insight was this unexpected, distant, um, distant piece of information that nobody had. So nobody had those two ideas in their head at the same time, apart from this guy. But he had to go to northern Canada to find it, which was obviously a bit of a trek. <laughs> um, and so as we progress through humanities, uh, through, through history, obviously, Clarence was, uh, uh, you know, he was inventing maybe 50, 60 years ago. Um, and as we uh, progress, then the volume of information in every single field of human endeavor um, is, is, is massively increasing. So just the amount of information that's out there, the amount of ideas, products, mechanisms, uh, tools, everything is just, the, it, it, it's huge. And it's much, therefore much, much more difficult to make these cross-domain links. So someone who works all their life in electronic switches, for example, is, gonna, uh, is never going to know anything about um, gearing mechanisms or something like that. But perhaps something in that, um, uh, in that field, in that distant field, would actually be hugely disruptive to, to what they're doing. Um, and at the moment, that process uh, is, is completely serendipitous. Um, and this, this, what I'm describing here, is the paradox of convergence. So as you have more ideas, um, more information, the availability of invention should increase, because there are more combinations that are available to, um, to, to create new ideas. Just the more information, the more combinations of them you can have. So you should have more inventions, but the invention disruptiveness and creativeness is going down and down over time. Um, and so uh, why is this? And the theory is that this is because there's this huge burden of knowledge. That um, 
what people want is just this knife. But what they are presented with is this huge Swiss Army knife that has everything on it. You don't know what to pick. Um, and so how do you filter down through that? Um, and the other thing on the side is, uh, is of course, the power of convergence. So wherever we've seen one, uh, one obvious, obvious example of, of convergence and incremental invention is uh, with the car, with the automobile. So the past hundred years, the car has been incrementally improved, um, getting better and better, um, going faster or further, sounding better, all of that. Um, and then this, a disruptive connection between two distant domains occurred. And now this is what a car looks like in 10 years, after, after 10 years of change. And so this has been a hugely disruptive, massively rapid change compared to the past, past hundred years. And that's the power of converging domains. Um, and so, of course, you also have an increased demand for convergence because people are observing this. It's happening a lot with any technology, um, uh, with, with software and AI, it's being applied to absolutely every domain available. But these aren't the only points of convergence. Um, and th this is, uh, so <laughs> this is uh, just an illustration of how companies are kind of perceive their products and they're afraid of convergence. So they want to be the ones to create this disruption. But at the moment, the process is still totally serendipitous. It, they, it's entirely re reliant on good luck. So this analog front end of invention uh, just, just doesn't keep up with uh, the ability that, that should be there to create points of convergence between domains. So the obvious question is, how can AI help? Um, and what we know about AI is that, oh, sorry, wait, no, I've missed a slide. Um, just to highlight the, uh, the, the kind of drive behind what actually set up the company that I work for is, um, is this realization that we live in a completely digitally driven world. Data is everything. Um, the marketing that's sent to you is driven by data and, and algorithms. And uh, e e even the financial systems are completely dependent on uh, on algorithmic trading and um, and huge amounts of data to find out uh, these often very subtle or difficult to find patterns in vast amounts of data. So we, we do this for really important human endeavor domains, but we don't do it for invention. We're still relying on analog invention and human good luck. So um, just to illustrate this, um, the head of IBM corporate strategy uh, Colin Harrison had this quote from 2013 that actually he has no idea where our inventions come from. <laughs> the, e even the head of one of the biggest leading tech companies in the world uh, five years ago was saying, I don't know, I don't know, we don't know. It just sort of happens. Um, so we, we want to try and put a bit more science into invention. Um, and try and find out how we can codify that science of invention into algorithms to try and invent faster and more disruptively than before. Um, and so what, what we think that AI can do here is, um, is to really leverage uh, the convergence so that there's growing information, more and more information. Um, and actually it's this breadth of information uh, which is essential to creating disruptive inventions. You want to know um, you want to know something from sport to be able to solve a problem in med tech or vice versa. So they're completely separate areas of science that's very unlikely for someone to have those two pieces of information at the same time. But using the AI solution, um, we can now address this problem. So just some very brief um, summaries of some tools that AI is bringing is um, natural language processing is, of course, enabling us to pro digitally process and comprehend uh, um, text in a, uh, in, a, in a completely new way that's, that's totally um, scalable and automatable. Um, so you can process all of human knowledge and understand it to some extent or, or, or recognize patterns in it, at least. Um, and the second one is machine learning, where perhaps you can find patterns that people even people can't find, they're more subtle. You can't, a person can't look at vast volumes of information to find these patterns over large scales, but AI can. So if I'm trying to invent in a particular area, what if I have access to exactly the right ingredients at the right time, just when I need them? 
And so that is what our company is doing. Um, it's taking AI software and it's using it to process uh, volumes of information from the internet. Um, and we then, uh, using that filtered information and, um, and, and, and processing, we're able to augment the human invention process um, so that uh, anybody, so all the people in this, uh, th this is our invention team, and all the people in this team are, uh, are not domain specialists. They're, they're, they're not particularly knowledgeable about one domain or another, but they have all invented, or have, they have patentable inventions in many, many different fields. So I personally have worked in, um, uh, in, in baby products, in satellites, in finance, in all sorts of different domains that I never thought I'd, I'd, I'd find myself in. Um, and I'm, I have patents being filed in those uh, because I was able to use this tool to find the right information at the right time. I didn't need this huge in-depth knowledge and education because I could use this AI tool to find just the information I needed at that time. Um, and just to illustrate the, the kind of power of this approach that's being applied is that um, the average inventor in their lifetime creates just three patents. Um, and this is actually incredibly expensive to companies as well. They invest loads and loads into their R&D departments and the average inventor just creates just three patents, but it's worth it. A prolific inventor is a, is a five sigma change from that, so it's, um, it's 15 inventions. So you're classified as a prolific inventor if you have more than 15 inventions. Um, and everyone who's worked for iProvia has managed to become a prolific inventor within their first year of working there. And I personally have over 40 patents um, in the last two and a half years. Um, so yeah, just to sum up that um, using these data-driven invention tools, we can really uh, massively augment the invention process and move um, move invention into the 21st century um, and change it from this analog process to a really data-driven um, process. So, thank you. Thanks so much. I think we've got some time for questions. So, does anyone have any questions? All right, I'm going to run around with a microphone. Uh, hi there. Um, <clears throat> um, I just wanted to ask about what your feeling was of software patents um, and how, you know, do they enhance our society, etc., or is it actually more detrimental to have software patents? I mean, look at the software wars that Apple and Samsung have been in. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so typically, um, software patterns are actually quite difficult to defend um, because there's no um, there's there's nothing you can point to and say that this is a thing that we invented. Um, this is the crux of the invention, um, and a lot of these a lot of these patterns actually do kind of take advantage of the fact that uh, you, you know they, they kind of take advantage of the legal system rather than. Um, rather than actually adding something definitely new. But the flip side of that is that um, a lot of these algorithms are potentially very difficult to, to create, um, and they might be easily backwards engineerable. Um, so how do you protect that idea? How do you, how do you protect that? Um, so I, I, I don't know, and I don't, I don't know if I have a solution to the problem, but I, I do agree that it is uh, a problem, and, and certainly some companies do abuse it for the detriment of society. Um, but Actually, um, our company doesn't uh, do doesn't work in so software or uh, or a couple of other domains uh, simply because um, this kind of uh, information processing that we do just works much better in the kind of uh, physical sciences and, and and technical areas like that. So um, typically, we would always have uh, some uh, physical mechanistic element to any invention that we create. Um, so I, I've got to say my expertise on, on purely software patents is, is quite limited. Okay, thank you very much. Any other questions? Oh, I've got one. <laughs> um, so a lot of the time, um, there seems to be a lot of technology that's out there 
purely for the sake of technology? How do you make sure that the inventions that you create are actually things that people need rather than uh, tech yeah, for yeah, tech's yeah. sake? This is a good question because that's, that's often one of the first things that you think of now that you have this ability to automatically generate ideas. That's just a fodder for patent trolls. Um, so the way we differentiate is just our, the business model that the company actually works with, um, where we ask companies, what are your problems? Um, and we, we, we basically work out what the area they're trying to work in, what, what are they trying to solve, uh, what are their problems, and then we find um, the most relevant uh, kind of insights and triggers from dis distant domains to match that project. And then we, so we create inventions that, the, the, that there is need for. Um, and we wouldn't work in a way that creates the inventions first and then finds someone to sell it to or to protect it from or things like that. But um, in terms of uh, will this happen in the future, maybe. Um, I don't know. I mean, the capability is there. Um, so it, it, might, it, it might well be a matter of time. OK, any more questions? If not, can you please join me in thanking Chris for this very interesting talk?